Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's guest is a little bit different today. This man might be the fastest human being I have ever seen run. Um, I don't think my car goes this fast, but he is a native Texan. He is also 100% Choctaw native, correct? Correct. I actually have some Hispanic and Mexican in me as well. But yeah, absolutely represent for the Choctaws 110%. Perfect. So without further ado, Mr. JP, Jeremy Guyana. Yes, sir. JP, how are we doing, man? Super blessed, Kevin. Appreciate you having me on, man. What a what a great opportunity to be able to just to chop it up with you and have some have some fun conversation. Absolutely, because usually I'm on the other end of uh, softball games trying to figure out ways to <laughs> keep you in the ballpark. So I've, hey, Isaiah and I had that conversation. I specifically said jp's gonna hit it here and, <laughs> and, tried to it warn and him. trying to run yeah so the only way to keep you from running is basically go stand on a base with the ball because you you would lap everybody on the field yeah i'm i'm, I'm definitely gonna my mentality is don't stop running and or get caught in a rundown because normally i can get out of it so that's what i'd <laughs> like to do i think it's entertaining to see the crowd actually see me get in a rundown and then to see me get out of it i think uh i think that's the fun part but I haven't been put in that situation yet because I guess apparently I'm making it around the bases too quick. <laughs> you are. We'll have to figure it out this year when we play. I think the game is yeah. November this year up in yeah. up in Frisco. So mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to it. A little bit better weather outside, which yeah. is good in the grass. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm, um, I'm looking forward to not having to run, Kevin. I just want to drop a bomb and then go back to my to my, to my seat. You know what I mean? Maybe. Maybe. You might be up, depending on the wind up there. You blow it yeah. blows out to left or right. There's, yeah. a, there's also a hot tub up there. You could figure <laughs> it up there, which is where we're playing I, Frisco I this year. I may just run past first base into the hot tub and then just call it a day at that point. You could. <laughs> that's all it is. That's, and you would probably get there faster than, than anybody else could. I don't. Like yeah. I said, I've never seen it. So yeah. I, I was doing a little bit of research on you, JP. Okay. You were, so Texas high school. What high school did you go to? Palmer High School, Palmer, Texas. No idea where that is. Palmer's about <laughs> 35 minutes south of downtown Dallas, down Highway 45. Normally it's, uh, most people know it as like a speed trap on the highway. Um, it's the <laughs> first uh, small city besides Ferris that you get to um, before Ennis, Texas. So I don't know if you're familiar with Ennis, yep. Texas. But yeah, it's uh, five minutes north of Ennis, and I'm telling you, if you're driving that way, do not speed on the highways. They'll get you. Okay. We'll make yeah. sure DPS doesn't know about all yeah. that. So yeah. is that a, what, 2A, 3A, 4A school? At the time, it was a 2A. Now, I think they've jumped up to 3A, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So I was doing, like I said, doing a little research. So mm-hmm. we talk about the speed. I'm mm-hmm. assuming that you ran track, right, with the speed that I've seen. But you were an all-state basketball player and went and played basketball in college? Yes, sir. Played basketball and baseball in college, Dallas, Dallas Mountain View Junior College. Um, also went to play a semi-professional basketball, so I did a little bit of work on the basketball end. Um, my heart was basketball. I loved it with everything that I had. Um, I should have probably went pro for baseball, to be honest, in all reality. Um, I just, like I said, I was a knucklehead and I wanted to pursue basketball, but truth be told, shortstop center field was right up my calling. I think I probably could have got paid minimum just to steal bases with the speed that I have. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, no. Did I run track? Um, yes. Did I practice it? No, because it interfered with baseball season. So a lot of the times our baseball was just our main focus because we were always, you know, Palmer has a pretty good track record of making playoffs and holding um, a long history of longevity throughout the playoffs, I should say. So yeah. Did I run track? No. Should I have done it more? Of course. And, you know, it's funny, Kevin, I didn't really run, but I went to state in long jump and high jump without any <laughs> practice. So I, I literally had the worst form doing high jump. You know, they tell you to pinch the penny. I don't know if you've heard that. Pinch the penny. Uh, when you jump over the pole in high jump, you're supposed to clench up and, and clench your cheeks oh, yeah. together. I yeah, didn't I have see. any form. I didn't have any of that. Uh, basically, it was just, hey, run up there and get over the pole. So Ended up doing that, ended up making district, was the first meet I went to, ended up making regionals, and then from that point on, went to state. And again, no practice. It was just get out there and do it. So I'm very blessed in that aspect for sure. Yeah, I actually, I just saw the other day, I think uh, Dick Fosbury passed away. Oh, created man. the Fosbury flop, and that's what yep. I figured. I mean, you probably, you could probably jump over that, the bar. <laughs> if that's, I, I've seen you yeah. with the way you run, being able to do that, were you? I mean... <laughs> I actually would just run forward and just try to throw my body over the best I could. Actually, like I said, no form, but I did clear six five. So I, I, 
I, I could imagine I probably could have got six 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 seven maybe if I had correct form. But yeah, it, it was all just run up there and just get over it. Don't care how you do it, just do it. And so that's how that's how it went. <laughs> It's amazing though how how blessed you are with the speed that you have and yeah. really have no practice for for I mean even watching the form because you know, a lot of kids don't even have the form to run mm -hmm. but I mean I hate running I I'd, mm -hmm. I'd run ninety feet and turn I've just I'd never understood <laughs> it some people it's their zen right they have yeah. but but watching you so I mean it's so you go play basketball mm -hmm. um, are you able to jump are you able to dunk and all and all the good stuff with it oh man you know. Now it's uh, I can get it. I can get some easy dunks in. But back then, college, high school, I was in between the legs, no practice, no warming up. Just go up there and boom it. I, I absolutely love dunking, and that's the one way that I made the basketball team was during baseball season. You know, I was in the gym and by myself shooting at Dallas Mountain View and head coach Phillips. Um, I guess it was observing me from behind the door and. Brother, man, I go up and I'm dunking left and right. I'm feeling good. You know, I'm, I'm stretching it out. And all of a sudden, uh, I put the ball down. And he walks in. He's like, hey, uh, why weren't you here at tryouts? And I was like, oh, coach, my bad. I, You know, I play baseball here. He's like, well, we've already made cuts. And, you know, I pretty much got my team set. But uh, I'm going to talk to the baseball coach tomorrow. And we'll see you out here at practice. So from that day forward, he, I'd literally go basketball practice at 1 o'clock. And then 3 o'clock, run up the park to the baseball field to be there for that practice as well. Um, safe to say I was the fastest kid in college on basketball and baseball team. And no one can mess with me on that, in that aspect. There's only one kid that came close. And to this day, Anthony, Anthony Lenz, his name, he'll still tell you. Nah, JP was just uh, unheard of fast. I'd never seen anybody that fast in my life in, in his, in his quotes, I should say. <laughs> I mean, I just, it's amazing though. Just to, just, just, like I said, no practice being able to do it. I'm, you know, I picture now Willie Mays Hayes, right? They kicked him out mm -hmm. of camp. They just, you know, you hop out of bed and you just, Everybody's got yep. a running start, and then mm -hmm. and then here you come. I mean, have you been mm -hmm. timed in a sixty or anything like that? Uh, the fastest time that I remember was at uh, the MLB scouting. It was a scout that they had with all you know three hundred kids come, and it's just the minor league scouting bureau. And uh, I think I ran my sixty in a six four six four nine with this forty split of four three nine or four three seven something like that. <laughs> Yeah, so the sixty, I was I was booking it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's getting going right out of the shoot. Some yeah. guys have a longer stride. Yours just yeah. seems to be go. And I always like the adage of I never see a cheetah stretch before it runs. That's that's you. Yeah. You don't stretch. I just see it's just it's gone. Yeah, it's it's just done. And I just cannot believe that you never actually ran track. You know, hurdles or something mm -hmm. where you just. I mean, so growing up, did you were you an only child? Did you have brothers and sisters that were. Uh, I am the only boy. I got three younger sisters, but our community that we lived in had boys all over my age. And one thing we always did was played sports. Uh, I also attribute it to our neighbor next door having um, farm animals, such as horses and donkeys. And so I would rope them, and then you know I'd try to get the try to get the rope back. So I'd have to chase the horse down. Um, I, I think genetically, that's where I'm the most fortunate in the ability to run because Native Americans, you know. My ancestors back in the day would just go, um, run, 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 whether they were hunting, whether they were trying to catch buffalo, maybe even running from some of your people, you know, who knows? Um, but <laughs> I attribute it to the, I attribute it to that, um, a lot of running in Native American history. And so, you know, even back to professional athletes, Jim Thorpe, Jim Thorpe was a runner and, you know, that's my mentor, the person that there's no other. He was Native American, correct? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, and a lot yep. of people don't know his history or the fact that he is actually the creator of the NFL and things of that nature. But Jim Thorpe. It's such a pivotal part in my history. Um, I don't know if Jim was as fast as me, but I'm willing to bet. I'm willing to bet he was he was up there. And uh, I attribute it to, like I said, genetics. I think it's just something in us that we're made to be runners. I got cousins and nephews that never practiced, but they could run. I mean, a mile in four and a half minutes, just just steady pacing and not even thinking about it. They just go. So I mean, it's always something that's been instilled in us. I'm, I'm, I I don't have a real good answer for you as to why I got it. I I feel like. I feel like Adrian Peterson, um, and I, I say that because he only just he just goes. There's no there's no takeoff. When you watch Adrian Peterson, every single pull he's digging as fast as he can, and he's just gone. Um, that's that's kind of actually heard my friends tell me that I run like Adrian Peterson. I, I I guess you can attribute it to me watching him growing up. I mean, I just I just love running, and I feel like people who put in the work. I don't know, man. Just putting in the work to be able to run fast. There's something to it, and and like you said, I hadn't really been able to. I have, have not had to put in that work, but uh, 
I don't know, the fruits of my labor are still coming out. It's just I'm I love running. Charlie Sheen, you know, once said he only has one speed, which is go. And that's how I feel when I take off running. <laughs> That's me on a, on a golf course or anything else, right? <laughs> Zero. There's no, yeah. Can yeah. you dial it down a little bit? No. I, I, I think even you trying to slow down, is, it's it's a graceful guide where it's four <laughs> steps and you're between second and third. It's just, yeah. but I think I bet a lot of it came from running from your sisters. Oh, yeah. Probably. Actually, my cousins, uh, I had a lot of boy cousins and man, they would, I remember one time running from my, my cousin because he wanted to shoot me with a BB gun. So <laughs> I took off running up a hill and I'm probably a football field away. He said he leaned up and aimed up about 10 feet above me and shot. And sure enough, that BB hit me right in the middle of the back. Um, but yeah, I attribute it to those, to those, my uncle um, chasing me. We, you know, animals just, yeah, trying to catch snakes all the time. I was a country boy. I, I, I was out there trying to catch animals and, you know, anything that ran fast, I would try to out catch it. So yeah, a lot of those things I attribute it to for sure. The, uh, you, you talk about, but that's not really the country though, right there, just south. Is it south of Dallas growing up? I mean, or is it, uh, I mean, when I picture yeah. the country, I'm picturing way out in the middle of nowhere stuff. That's, yeah, I mean, yes, to them out there, definitely it's the country. Um, to city people from Dallas, definitely the country. Uh, I can't believe most people from Dallas have never drove 20 miles south to even see a cow. They got to go to the zoo to see that. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Drive 20 minutes down the road and you'll see a cattle or some cow, I'll promise you. So, I, I consider it country um, just because of the lifestyle, the Western wear, the friends that I made. It's predominantly white. I think, you know, at the time I was going to school, there may have been 10 Hispanics and maybe three, three black kids. That's it. So, I mean, yeah, it's it's, you know, it's smaller and it's close enough to the city, but it's also it's also country enough to consider country for sure. Is it a is there a big Choctaw contingent in that area or is it just where your dad and, and family grew up i mean you know sometimes it's they yeah. tend to i guess congregate to certain areas is that mm -hmm. i just wasn't sure if it was a big i mean Choctaw's only what an hour and a half uh, from where yeah. you live no uh this was because of my grandfather's doing he moved down here for work reasons he was a marine choctaw veteran uh went through uh hardship trying to find work in oklahoma i believe and so ended up moving to texas where he found a good job and just I think Palmer was just a small country town and, you know, he found good three acres on that he could build a house on. And so it was just perfect for him and to set up, especially for growing. Um, you know, he had my mom and my aunt and my uncle. So three of them and just got them four wheelers, got them dirt bikes, got them dune buggies and just let them have a blast out there in those three acres. I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but to us, three acres back then, I mean, it's 150,000 acres to us because we just had the opportunity to go roam and have a good time. So I attribute it to, my grandfather, but in the aspect of, is there a lot of Choctaws in this area? Specifically, no. Most of my family is still in the Durant, Atoka, um, Pushmataha, Oklahoma. I mean, there's a bunch of different places. Tallahanna, Tushkahoma, southeastern Oklahoma area. That's more or less where my side of the tribe actually resides still. So, yeah, you'll catch a lot of my family up there in Durant area for sure. So you get a chance to to go up to to I've never been up in through Durant I've oh, you know been up through Tulsa never been through Durant it just but it, you know we've been up through Windstar yeah. and going up to Oklahoma City yeah. but I've never really been to that south is it right considered a southeast corner of Oklahoma mm -hmm. absolutely right? and that's so growing up there you know the red right does Red River run right through Durant Yep it runs well okay. it splits Texas splits yeah. Texas and it's I think there's maybe one or two small cities in between there but yeah it's it's, uh, it's right there on the border. So, so, so growing up as, you know, a Native American kid is what, what were you looked at differently growing oh, yeah. up as far? I mean, you know, we talk about right now about how kids, people look at everybody differently, right? Mm -hmm. So growing up, um, I know we were talking about your hair. You haven't cut it in 12, 13 years, mm -hmm. you said. Mm -hmm. um, so growing up, what, you know, what was it like as a Choctaw uh, um, Indian growing up in yeah. Texas? What, yeah. what was it like? It was different. Um, on one side of the realm, you have relatives and family members and cousins and friends that say, you know, you're a fake native because you didn't grow up on the reservation. You didn't grow up with your people. And to an extent, I understand where they're coming from, but I don't know what the difference is as far as struggling. And what I mean by that is my struggle was just the same, if not even more harder or more hard because of my ethnicity in a, such a small white school. And I didn't know, I didn't know the implications of the things that I was dealing with, such as the racist comments and things of that nature, it never really hit me and never really bothered me because I never allowed it to. But yeah, there was quite a bit growing up. Uh, 
I didn't ever really grow my hair out in high school because for one, you weren't allowed to. So I always kept it short, ball fade, um, looking more Hispanic for sure. Now, there are times where I wished when I was younger that I wished I could scrape off my skin color so that way I could have more friends. So if I could just wipe my skin off, then the white kids would accept me more. And I think that is something now that I'm very grateful for. Uh, it took me a long time to grow into that and to learn, um, but I'm very grateful that I didn't change my skin color or that nothing uh, in, in that sense changed me to be who I am today. Because if I wouldn't have gone through those things, then there's no way I would have learned. And it taught me a lot of what not to do. You know, there's people who have the ability to learn from other people's mistakes. And that's one thing I have the ability to do. And so I'm very grateful for it. Um, but it was tough, but it wasn't tough in the aspect of I couldn't get through it. I, I had great friends to this day, long life friends. I think I would actually put my child in Palmer because of especially starting from a little age from elementary most of the kids that I went to school with I had known before preschool so it was a beautiful thing to have that and I'm very grateful for that I think I think it's a it's a perfect place to live as far as friendship community of course everyone knows everybody's business and it's great um, it can be great I should say it's not always great um, for me though it was different but it was never too too difficult i'm very blessed and grateful that i had the upcoming that i did for sure very very poverty stricken we weren't you know well off by any means single uh, single wide trailer home my mom and my my dad split when i was you know very young and it was just me and my three sisters in one room and my mom in the other so it you know there was times where it was very difficult but we never felt that we never knew at the time we were we were we were blessed to have everything we needed my mom never knew um, she never allowed us to know struggle i should say she always kept a hot meal every night. And after working, you know, 10 hours a day, she'd come home and still, it didn't matter if it was hamburger helper, you know what, we had a warm meal. And uh, that's something that I'm very grateful for because, you know, my mom, she could have easily have threw her hands up and told us to cook her own food. And she didn't, she, she, she gave us everything we needed, man. And, and I think the biggest thing she taught us was love, to love what we have and to appreciate what we don't. So yeah, uh, yeah, uh, very fortunate to be raised in Palmer, Texas and grow up the way that I did. Yeah, because it creates, it gives you opportunity to explain to your kids, mm -hmm. right, what it was, what it was like that it's, you know, because the world's ever evolving, right? We always, mm -hmm. and, you know, play, playing baseball, you play with, you know, guys from all walks of life, you oh, know? Yeah. Um, I remember my, actually my, my rookie year, I played with a guy from, um, gosh, he's from North Carolina, his name's Brandon Warriax. Mm -hmm. I can't think of the name of the tribe, but it'll come to me as we sit here and talk about it. But just, but I, I would have never thought of, you know, but he's from, Lumby. He's a part, he's a Lumby Indian. Is that, is that, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, that's, that's where he's from. He's from Lumby, mm -hmm. uh, wherever the town is. And just, just hearing that though. And just, but I, I never would, you didn't think about that, right? Yeah. That's just, yeah. you're, you're, it doesn't, whether you're, you're black, white, yellow, green, we're mm -hmm. all the same thing. So growing up with that and it's, and it's tough though, you know, I always, you know, growing up on the East coast, mm -hmm. not, you know, being, you know, as the vastness of how things are, but, you know, being able to see that, seeing how, and hearing stories like you, you're telling me about what it was like growing up, because I, I didn't see that growing yeah. up. But then hearing it, you, and then being able to take that, explain to your kids, and understand that it, it's a, it's scars and whatever happened then. They, mm -hmm. they, they were reminders of it, but they also made who you are to this moment. Mm -hmm. Correct. Absolutely. And so, so you took what you learned from, you know, from your parents splitting up to that, mm -hmm. up, up to today now. So your, mm -hmm. your, is it your son? Correct. I have a daughter. Your, your daughter, okay. Mm -hmm. So she's how old? Uh, she'll be two in July. Okay, so you're she's she's just starting to to learn, and the questions mm -hmm. will start flying here soon. Where you they start, and you're just like, okay, gosh, is there enough questions? Um, yeah. But hearing that, so and then leading up to to where you are now, to the acting, the mm -hmm. um, the modeling, the yeah. um, you know, just you know, like I said, every time I follow you on social media, it's always. It's it's about your Native American heritage that you were so proud of. It's, it's, talk to me a little bit about that and how that is has formed you as as a as a Texan, but as a Choctaw Texan, right? Or however you want to you claim yourself to be. Yeah, I I attribute it to um, growth. I wanted to learn more about my culture, learn more about my people, so that way, whenever I get asked certain questions, I have the knowledge to share that with others. And so I still don't know it all. I'm still not efficient in my language. I'm actually taking classes now to learn it better. Um, but that's one of the things that I attribute to whenever I post on social media. Uh, I want to make sure other people know that we are bigger than what they've been taught. 
uh, because a lot of people haven't been taught anything. And so for me, I feel like I have this platform to acknowledge people who have come before me and the people that will come after me. And that's the biggest part that I feel as though, even though I may not have the knowledge and I may have not grown up on a res and I may not have um, certain traditional ways, I can open a door for other people to explain their traditional ways. So that's kind of why I consider myself a bridge or maybe in a, just an open door or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, I think that it's pivotal for me to open doors for other people so that way their stories can be heard as well. Because there's a lot of people who are silent and have been um, shunned from expressing their feelings and, and it's just frowned upon for them to speak out. And so if they can speak vicariously through me or if I can open a door for the, get, to give them a platform to use, I mean, that's that's what it's all about. And that makes me feel a lot better with my ancestors as well. You know, I, I talked to a good friend named Mo Brinks plenty one time and I told him, you know, I didn't understand how things were happening like they're having you know, photo shoots, movies, TV shows. And I, I, I told him I kind of felt guilty because our ancestors went through so much um, that we will never know about. But here I am getting the limelight. I'm getting exposure. I'm getting likes and loves from random people. And it's, you know, I kind of felt guilty about it. And I told Mo that and he said, J.P., you're exactly where you need to be. Um, you're representing for our ancestors. And the reason that you're going to have it so good right now is because of what they went through. They opened this doorway and this path for you. So you accept it, you know, and, and that really hit me, man. It, it, I was like, OK, you know, you got a very good point. You know, I, I'm I shouldn't have to struggle. We, we shouldn't have to go through any of that pain that we've already been through because it's already been done for. And so, yeah, I, I, I think I think it's very powerful to me to be able to open that door. And just to allow other people to speak, uh, I, I think that's key for me. And what that does for me is it teaches me and also allows me to learn and grow at the same time. So I'm winning both ways. <laughs> yeah. So, you're, you know, some I guess sometimes, you know, generationally parents say, you know, from other countries, mm -hmm. they'll they won't learn the language because they, mm -hmm. they just kind of was forgotten. Did your parents speak to you in in the native the Choctaw language growing up or was it just mm -hmm. something where more? just this conversation? Uh, it was, you know, small words here and there. Um, never really conversational. My grandfather was full blood Choctaw and could speak portions of it, but even he himself, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? So he eventually started losing it, especially when he got to Texas and got in the Marines and things of that nature. Yeah, he just, just strayed from the language. And so for me, I really wanted to touch those roots and I really wanted to learn more. And so I started digging in and there's acting classes and I got with my chief, I got with my tribe and I got with the people who um, put the classes together. And, and so I'm taking those steps to get better at it. But at the same time, it's difficult because I'm learning other languages from other tribes for certain roles. So it can get very, very tricky. It's not an easy language. And so I could understand why my grandparents would lose it and or not speak it to us because it's just, it's not, it's not simple, Kevin, by any means, man. It's difficult. You can't just go get Babel or, or any yeah. of these and, and learn. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's it? funny you say that because even if they, if there was like a specific app, your Choctaw nation of Oklahoma Choctaws are going to speak different than the Mississippi band is going to speak. Even if you go into the reservation, there's going to be different words that they use that may have a completely different meaning. So it's it's a slippery slope when you when you say, hey, I know this language, but then you speak to somebody who also speaks it in a different way. And they're like, no, you don't, because that's not how he would say it. So, you know, it's 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 dangerous, man. It's a it's a it's a wild, wild, um, it's a wild, wild world as far as the native culture and native language goes. It's it's a, and it, you know, as your daughter's growing up, it's easier probably to teach her to get her to learn it, which would mm -hmm. help, you know, help yeah. both of you to, to grow For sure. in that aspect. So 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 learning you know the, the language and you were saying that not being born on a reservation are, mm -hmm. are they are you looked at almost as like a that much like shun because you're not you know like regardless if so, you know some people say you're Choctaw you're Choctaw wherever you are mm -hmm. but there For are sure. those that on a reservation that say you're not Choctaw because of of this how does that make you feel I understand where they're coming from I mean I completely get it um like I said earlier though you would just rather me struggle with you there versus struggle somewhere else on my own. And the thing about it being there is, is that we're kind of limited to what we can or can't do. And specifically with the government and, you know, land and certain things, you, you basically are set to this certain aspect. For me, I didn't have those boundaries. I didn't have those regulations. So it was, I was a little bit more freedom on my end. Um, also, to those that say, you know, he's not as native or, or whatever because he didn't grow up with his people and things of that nature. My only response is, is, 
as well. I'm just as much native as anybody else. Now, what that means is I acknowledge that I had didn't grow up and I'm not traditional like others, but I want to learn from you. So instead of shunning me and bashing me, how about you educate me and teach me so that way I can teach others? That's the way I look at it. Uh, now, there are still, you know, there's still always going to be negative with every bit of positive, no matter where you go, no matter what you do. Um, but I'm very grateful because like I said, and like you said earlier, I mean, it's just taught me a different way of life. If I had grown up with them, I don't know if my life may have been the same. It may have been completely different. And I feel as though, yeah, I still would have been picked on, still would have been bullied. It just would have been by my own people. And I don't know if that's any much better. <laughs> yeah. Very, yeah. I mean, I get, I completely understand that, you know, when you go into a place and, um, you know, they look at you and go, uh, they won't talk to you, but they'll talk to maybe your grandfather because mm -hmm. he's was right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, that's the thing. And it's just, yeah. but it's, it seems like, so they are still kind of drawing lines, but unlike you, you draw circles, right? That's mm -hmm. what we're here yeah. for is to draw yeah. circles around mm -hmm. people because you, at one, it's not your fault. You were born, you yeah. weren't born on a reservation, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and that's the thing that I think yeah. that's part of it, you know, kind of where we are today in society is it, you know, we talk about slavery. I, I didn't own any slaves. You know, I'm just, I was born here. I, right. They're, you're no different than you and than, than I yeah. am, but, yeah. but there are those people that say it doesn't matter. And right. So, I mean, it's, yeah. it's hard and I'm sure that's hard to, to deal with. Yeah. Right. I, I respect those people though, because yep. they're holding true values to the traditional ways. And mm -hmm. that means so much. So when I look at it, I, I always want to say, I wish <sighs> Uh, when it comes specifically to my tribe Choctaws, do I get shunned? Does anybody act that way towards me? No, um, not at all. It's all love. It's been beautiful. Uh, I think because I am representing Choctaws in such a positive light. Now, if I were out here doing things inappropriately or, you know, posting pictures with drugs and guns and all this different stuff, that, that'd be one negative aspect to look at it. But on all honesty, all I've done for the Choctaws is just open up doors to people to let people know that we're more than a casino. You would not believe how many people say, oh, like the casino. I'm like, no, like the Native American, like the tribe. Um, it just, it's just, you know, it's just That's real common. ignorance, though, on people's part of knowing yeah. that. I, I was just in yeah. Arlington today driving past yeah. Choctaw Stadium, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And just seeing the sea with the with the feather. Just mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't think of casino. I just think, you know, it's yeah. just a Native American, the Choctaw yeah. The Choctaw Nation type of yeah. thing. So it's, and it, and it's it's amazing now. Like I said, you wanting to kind of delve into your history and make mm -hmm. yourself better and learn because you've mm -hmm. you know you've missed that part and and wanting to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so so doing and doing so, how does that help you into your acting career and 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 um, and, and I guess talk about the modeling stuff as well. How has that helped you just um, just as a, as a just as a Choctaw Native? How has that and made you feel helping that? it's given me all the confidence in the world. Uh, I'm so proud to be able to represent um, beyond Choctaws just for indigenous people all over the world. And it's just ultimately confidence. Uh, I feel as though when I go in to do photo shoots or whenever I'm getting in front of the camera, I know that I have ancestors working through me, with me, and for me, and they're gonna make me um, represent them to the best form of my abilities. And so with that mentality, I, Kevin, how can I fail? You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's given me the ultimate amount of confidence in saying, hey, this is what's for me. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to put my best effort towards it. And that's just that's just something that's instilled in me. And I, I, I'm so grateful for that. Um, it, just beyond Choctaw, beyond indigenous, I, I think there's also more of a bigger picture of just being a small town little kid who finally got an opportunity to do something big. And I, you know, they gave me an inch and I took a mile, so to say, and I'm going to continue to keep pushing and going and I also have to say that if every single thing happened today or ended today, there was no more photo shoots, no more TV shows, no more movies. Kevin, I'm very blessed and grateful to be able to say that I've done what I've done to this point. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fine with it if I'll end it tomorrow. I'm very humbled for it, for sure. I mean, it, that's one <laughs> thing I've always noticed about you, JP, is always have that smile on your face Try every to, time, man. right? Uh, like I said, I was doing a little bit of research on you and it talked about you when you go to these, these photo shoots, to the movies that you're doing that you really, it, it's kind of, I think it, it goes into how you're attacking your, your, your Choctaw heritage. Mm -hmm. You dive into this. You mm -hmm. want to know everybody that's there because, because it seems like you, you, you're like me, you want more information. You just want as much as you can. And talk about that. Is how, is that how you were always raised was just to, I'm, I, for a better word, you just hit the ground running. And that, mm -hmm. maybe that contributes to why you're so fast. But is that part of just how you were raised? Or is that just something that you kind of just developed and understood that if I'm going to do this, 
I really need to dive in. I attribute it to everything, especially the way I was raised. And what I mean by everything is, you know, the hateful comments, the racist things I've heard. I use those things and remember how I felt when they were done towards me or how they were said to me. And then I want to apply that to the way I interact with other people and let them know that that's not how they should feel. And regardless of if somebody makes them feel that way, there's somebody else who thinks completely opposite. So, yeah, um, it was a lot of the way that I grew up. My mom taught me and instilled love in me, of course. Um, but I was a hothead growing up. You know, Kevin, sports, I probably didn't go pro uh, because of my attitude. I was uncoachable. I knew it all. Like you said, I never practiced. I was the best at whatever I did. And being from such a small school, it was easy to be, you know, one of the better athletes mm -hmm. with no practice. So, I eventually made a change and I don't recall when that change happened. It may have been when I got to my, um, it may when I got to college and set my butt on the bench and realized that I wasn't the greatest that this may have happened, but I decided, you know what, JP, this entire time you've been negative, you've been hot headed, you haven't listened, you've been uncoachable. Why not try things differently and see what happens? So I did that. I made that transition and that transition consisted of interacting with people who, um, maybe strung out on drugs and homeless, interacting with CEOs of the Dallas Morning News the same way as if they were the one. And so I started contributing, or attributing that and doing that in every single day of walk of life. No matter who it was, where you came from, your financial status, your religion, I don't care what sex you claim, whatever. I always treated everybody with love and that has opened so many doors for me in my life. And I think that's something that I really want to attest to people and to preach is that even though you're going through something hard, never let anyone know. Always try to keep that positive because that one positive impact you make on someone else's life could come back to you tenfold. And you don't even know that it could happen, but someone out there is watching. Um, my basketball coach used to tell me perception is everything. I didn't ever really understand what he meant until I got to that level of fully grasping the context of perception in general. And then whenever I did apply that and I started thinking, my goodness, you know, doing this this way, that one little kid over there saw me throw my bat, saw me throw my helmet. I don't want that. Um, I started making changes then and there. And it's it's very much a lot of different things that tied into it. Um, I, I feel as though I want everyone to feel as though they not only have an opinion, but that their opinion opinion is heard. Because that's all anybody ever wants is just to feel like they're a part of something. And if I can make a person who's setting up a light stand, feel good about himself or tell him that he's got cool boots and that I like them, you know, to make him feel confidence boosted. And man, that's, that's the easiest thing for me to do. How, how hard is that? You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to continue to boost people up and hopefully they continue to pass that on. Um, you know, when I go on Instagram live, I'm always telling people, look, I want you to do something for me today or something for yourself. And that's just picking up the phone and Call somebody I haven't talked to in 10 years and tell them you love them and hang up. I don't care, but reach out to people, make them feel good about themselves. Make sure that you know that we acknowledge them and that they are here and that they have a purpose and that we want to be a part of their purpose because you never get tomorrow, man. It's never promised. So while I'm here, I want everyone to know that I love them and that um, with me, there's going to be positive vibes, positive energy around. And if there's not, then we're not going to be hanging out. It's just how it goes. I, I yep. feel as though everyone, everyone around us has the ability to smile and laugh, no matter how hard things get. Um, I never lose that, never lose that mentality that you have the right and the ability to be happy on your own. Yeah, I, I said I was, as, as I was doing a little bit of homework. JP talked about mm -hmm. you always you talk about if you've changed one person's life, right? Make mm -hmm. some you've done your job that day. Yeah. That's all. You're, that's all we're asked to do, and and mm -hmm. that's a philosophy I've always I, I live by, just because. Right. You, you never know what somebody's going through at that For moment. Sure. And, it, and it's hard. Right. We all we all don't kind of get in of the way, you know, we'll do stuff and go, gosh, you know what? I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that understanding. And then, then you hear the backstory and you go, oh, gosh, now I feel, right, you feel even worse. So mm -hmm. and it's it's a philosophy. But it's it's amazing that you were able to something just clicked and you go, gosh, dog. Well, you know, I think everybody has a moment where, all right, this isn't working. So mm -hmm. let's let's try this. Mm -hmm. And then and that was what? 20 years ago, 15 years, Man. how long ago was that? I was probably, it was probably 11, 15, 15 years ago, somewhere around there. I literally started thinking, you know, how, how, how come is this, how come I'm not pro? How, how come out of 300 kids, I'm um, the second, I think I was the first fastest kid there, it may have been one or two. And I remember I threw, I threw in like 94 from right field to home plate. Not one person called me. And, and I, I, the only thing that I contributed to was the negative energies. Maybe they had reached out to a high school coach and maybe he told him the truth. You know, JP was uncoachable, blah, blah, blah. And so I started thinking, man, 
out of all this all this talent and this ability and it's all wasted pretty much in a sense not wasted but it's gone because of negative energies negative attitude and so yeah i i really wanted to make a change and i did and i can't tell you how beneficial and powerful that has been in me for me in my life uh, i got friends all over i got friends like i said who own multi-million dollar big companies who are professional athletes and I also have friends who are junkies right now shooting heroin in between their toes. Um, I don't treat them any different. I treat them the same. And, you know, I, I attribute that to, I did grow up um, very religious, very, I think it was Pentecostal, non-denom- non-denominational, however you want to say it. We were dancing, we were happy, we were singing in church. And, you know, Jesus Jesus always said he hung down with the slums. He, he was out there with the criminals and the bad people. And I think that's kind of how I feel. And I relate that very much back to Christianity because... I I have a purpose, and that's just to go down there into the areas no one else wants to go and just make them feel loved on too and let them know they're people just like us, just like anybody else, regardless. And so that's just kind of the mindset that I've always had and kept. And man, it's it's a beautiful thing because I have no fear about where I go, um, whether it's in Highland Park or South Oak Cliff. I, I, I have no fear. I'm not worried about anybody. I, I feel comfortable because I realize that we're all just people. And if you just treat that person with respect and love on them, I think for the most part, you're going to be okay. Absolutely. It's, it's amazing. You talk about 15 years ago from where you were mm-hmm. in college to, to now. So how, so what led into the acting side of it, the modeling side of it? What had, did something just, were you out doing something and somebody just said, Hey, we, you know, I don't, I don't know how that works as far as the, the acting side of it. So I mean, it, I've got it, a face made for radio. So <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Uh, it's crazy how it happened, Kevin. Uh, I worked for the Dallas Morning News handling marketing and advertisement. I'd been there for five, six years at the time. And uh, I'm walking to work one day, and they're filming Queen of the South, a Netflix show, uh, right across the street at the Carlisle Room, which is literally backside door to where we entrance employees enter the Dallas Morning News. So I'm walking up, have my earpods in, and you know I'm just jamming out, and some guy's like pointing and waving. So I take out my earphone, earpods, and I'm like, what? And he's like, actors down the hallway to the left. I'm like, What? And he was like, actors go down the hallway to the left. And I was like, I'm, I'm not an actor. He's like, oh, man, I'm, I'm sorry. He's like, well, hey, here's my card. Go to this website. We're looking for native Mexican background actors. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So he was like, find a white wall, take your picture, post it on there, and call me or shoot me an email when you're done. I was like, yes, sir. I went inside, you know, anything, nothing of it. I just, okay, whatever. Went in there and found the white wall, put my picture up. Um, next thing I know, I get a call from Legacy Casting within like five minutes, man. And they are like, Oh my gosh, we love your look. We'd love to know uh, if we can get you for background. And at this time, I still had to use PTO. So I calculated some PTO days up and I went and did, I think, three days of some background work for the show. On the show, I met, you know, Elise Braga, the main star. God bless Elise Braga, she's a sweetheart. Uh, I met Zahn McLernan, which is one of the biggest Native American actors, um, somebody that I look up to, uh, a good friend of mine. And so, you know, I'm doing background work. I'm loving on everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm a background, but all the A-list celebrities are over at the table talking to me and we're all just laughing and goofing off. And I remember one of the PAs came up. He's like, dude, he's like, actors never come out of their, come out of their rooms and hang out with you guys. He's like, well, something about you, JP. And I was like, well, I don't know what's going on. Right. So anyway, uh, the writer came up to Zahn and asked Zahn if he knew any Native Americans that he could give, they could give a minor speaking part to. And Zahn looked at us and was like, give these guys a chance. So one thing led to another, uh, they asked for us, for us to audition for it. We did it. And then, boom, I got a minor speaking part on Queen of the South. So with that said, after that aired, people were like, who is this guy? Where did he come from? Does he have an agent? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, I remember at lunch that day, I was talking to Zahn, and I told him, you know, I, I, I think this is fun, man. This is cool. And he's like, you should do it. He's like, you got a great look. You got a great head on your shoulders. He's like, and there's going to be a lot of projects coming out soon where more native, uh, native actors are getting booked. So I suggest you get in acting classes. Boom. A week later, I'm in acting classes, um, got an agent, and here we are now with two agents, two managers, a modeling agency. Uh, just, I, I, I don't know, man. It's, it's almost overwhelming to think from then until now in a matter of almost, what, four or five years, maybe six years that I've done what I've done. I mean, there's people who've been in the industry for 20 plus years and haven't had the opportunities that I have. And I, uh, I don't take that for granted, man. I promise you. The, uh, so and so once you get into the acting side of it, you were talking about Native American uh, mm-hmm. actors. You know, you, you mentioned the one gentleman, um, and I was I was telling somebody today. I 
I, I can say it was Lou Diamond Phillips. Is Lou Diamond, is he Native American? Yes, sir. Is Portion he, of him. Okay. Okay. Yes, and that's, I mean, that's the guys that I, when I think of, of mm-hmm. Native American actors, you just, you know, him just, he had that, just that rugged backcountry look mm-hmm. of, right? And then, so were there other ones you kind of were able to do some research on and kind of, and, oh, yeah. you know, and learn, cause like I said, you're always diving into stuff. So did you dive mm-hmm. into that side and try and find more of these Native American actors and actresses? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think the main guy besides Zahn that I focused on, of course, is Wes Studi. Wes Studi is the last of Mohicans. He's, you know, he's say no words, just look at his face and you know what he's doing. That is something that I actually use for a lot of my auditions. Before I get into character, I'll watch this scene just to study his facial features because he makes that scene at the very end so strong and he doesn't have to say a word. And so Wes Studi, Gil Birmingham, I mean, Adam Beach, you know, I watched, um, Adam Beach, of course, on Navajo. Uh, he's a Navajo co-talker for uh, Wind Talkers. And my gosh, these guys, I mean, they really, really, really did open up some amazing opportunities for us here in the future, which is now. And studying their work, uh, it's just, you know, it means something to be able to say, hey, that guy represents what I represent, or I'm representing what he represents. And I could actually get there. I can do that. And so, yeah, those guys opened up a lot of doors and they just completely opened up my eyesight to understanding that, hey, this is real and there's real opportunity for you to succeed. Um, you just got to put in the work and continue to get better at being just not even a better actor, but also just a better human being, a better person in general. So so nowadays you are, you were shooting, is it Chosen? Is that the one that you're working on now? Or I, is work, it, I work production for The Chosen, so I handle locations for the show. For, the, for Chosen. And then was it 1883 was the one that you were a part of as well yeah. were you a part of Ye- was it yellowstone as well uh, 1883 is like the precursor to yellowstone so we're in the yellowstone okay. universe but i wasn't actually a part of yellowstone no sir okay yeah okay so so doing that um you know i, I see you know you see some of your photos from from the shoot on social media you know just looking at i've seen of the war paint and just you riding mm-hmm. like riding a horse is that mm-hmm. something that you something you did as a kid right so riding mm-hmm. a horse and so that's nothing new to you to be able to to, to do that right but to be able to act and, mm-hmm. and everything i've never ridden a horse so i know nothing about it <laughs> yeah we got to get you on a horse man we got to get you a 20 gallon hat and then get you on a horse dude they don't have hats if it has a, vi- <laughs> give me a cowboy visor that'd be the only thing i could wear that's good that's great we'll find something for you man we can make it out of loincloth or something i don't know we'll yeah yeah, just, uh, yeah some cowboy boots i don't even know cowboy i've seen people put their feet in them and i don't no, to struggle to put their feet in the boots, and I'm sure that you you probably got pairs. You love cowboy boots, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. But Actually, you can't run in cowboy boots, can you? I mean, I, can you run I'm, fast I'll run cowboy anything. Boots? We'll find out. There's yeah. no way that looks like it would hurt my feet trying to do that. Oh, I, I'm sure there's some pain that comes along with it, but yeah, I guarantee you, we can still get it in some cowboy boots. But oh, me, gosh, I'd rather no. just take off my shoes and run barefoot. So, guys, Kevin Mench here on the Big Head Pod, just sitting down, sitting here thinking about some of the whiskey. That we've been been uh, privy to being a part of sponsor here on our show, Herman Marshall Whiskey. You guys get a chance to drink this stuff. Try it out. The single malt is by far the best one they have. There's four kinds. They have a single malt. They have a blend. They have a bourbon. They have a rye. The order I would go in is a single malt by far. I just found this. Don't ever try and take this from me. I might have to beat you with the bottle. Then the rye, the blend, and then the bourbon. This stuff is phenomenal. Texas made and Texas produced here, guys. This is stuff is unbelievable so if you get a chance to do it go grab yourself a bottle this stuff is amazing going into the acting you know of representing the choctaw nation have they mm-hmm. opened up more to you of wanting you to be a part of it you know what i mean as far as bringing you in to do you know it's like you, you talked about uh yesterday you were a couple of days ago you were on with a gentleman that had you were talking about your hair for mm-hmm. instance about what what does that mean what does the, the long hair represent you i mean i was trying to understand a little bit but Mm-hmm. I know nothing about hair. I don't have any. So mm-hmm. I'd let you explain <laughs> since, since your locks are about two, two and a half feet long. Well, I can tell you that I've always grown up with the knowledge that our hair is our power. Um, everything that we have good comes from our hair. So whenever we have people braid our hair, like for example, when I'm on set and I have a new hairdresser that's about to do some braids for a scene, um, what I normally do is first off call my grandmother, have her pray. Um, for the lady and what I mean by that is she prays that the lady has good intent with every braid because every single braid strand has you have to have good intent I can't just allow anybody just to walk up to me and touch my hair which quick funny story 
Um, I don't know why people feel as though it's appropriate to just come up and be like, hey, can I touch your hair as they're touching my hair? <laughs> and I'm like, no. And you would not believe the amount of people that get offended when I tell them no. I'm like, listen, I don't mean to offend you, but this is this is powerful to me. I can't just ha- I don't know where your hands have been. I don't know what energies you have that you've put into my hair. So please just note to everybody out there, do not go up to any single person out there and touch their hair. Okay. Now I don't know how Kevin feels about you rubbing his bald head. That's fine. But don't come up and touch random people's hair, please. I just want to, I just want to make that public service. announcement. It's like rubbing a pregnant woman's stomach. Do you mind? Oh my gosh. It's, it's, it's bizarre, man. Kevin, I cannot, I cannot explain to you or tell you how many times that happens throughout a day of someone just feeling obligated or, I always say, oh, you're entitled to just feel like you can just touch my hair. I'm like, no, 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 that's not how it works. Um, yeah, it, the the hair is so powerful. Um, whenever you lose a relative that's very close, you know, you're supposed to, in our from our beliefs, you're supposed to cut your hair and put it in the casket with them. Um, my grandfather passed, and of course, our situation's a little different, me being on TV and representing him and things of that nature now. And I remember asking him, you know, do you want me to cut my hair? And he's like, no. He's like... I, I cut off a couple pieces, but he was like, no, um, for what you have going, I need you to keep your hair to keep representing us because I know that that's a big factor in you getting booked is you having your hair. So it's it's a very spiritual thing to us. And I, I, I don't want to compare it to Avatar, but it's very much like the Avatar when he connects his hair to his horse. Um, and horses are very spiritual and powerful to us as well. Now, I have just kind of bring that up as an example to show you the, the meaning and the powerful mm-hmm. Um, concept that we have the ideas with our hair it's it's a uh, it's very 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 important and I honestly I don't think I'll ever cut it you know I just I don't I don't think so <laughs> do you ever put it up in in I mean at all so even if it's you know called trying to and I'm not so much hide it but you know some women do like right? they tuck it up underneath oh, yeah. do you just leave it regardless of of how it Depend, is depends on what I'm doing that day man if I'm out riding four wheelers, riding, you know, dune buggies and my hair is just going to be blown in the wind. I'm definitely putting it up because that damage that comes from the wind and from the dry air, uh, it's not good for my hair. So yeah, every now and then you might see me with a man bun rocking it. Um, but for the most part, I'm going to keep that to myself at home. If I'm going out, I'm going to have it down. Or if I'm fortunate enough, I'll have someone come and braid it for me. I, I can't braid it myself, man. I just, I'm too really? impatient. I'm too impatient. Like I try and then my shoulders start burning, and, you know, I start dropping cuss words and I'm over it. Like I'm just too mad. <laughs> I, I, I literally don't have the patience for it, man. I wish I did. But uh, to say that, though, I can I can braid uh, just not my hair. You know what I mean? You can do your daughter's hair? Yeah, I can I can definitely do her hair and I can braid. But she's going to want to start doing your hair. You know that, right? Hey, she's, she's more than welcome to. The mannequins and everything else. Daddy, can I play with your hair and, and doing this stuff? But, yeah. I mean, washing it. I mean, it takes me. 30 seconds and I'm done. I mean, it, that looks like that is a good 30 minutes of washing your hair before. I mean, well, it, it, that- it would be Kevin. If I washed out my conditioner, what I do is I put conditioner in the ends and I just let it sit. I don't blow dry it. I don't, I just basically like give it a little towel push and then I let it air dry. So I cut out a good, a good five minutes just in that end alone. So, but for the most part, literally I, it doesn't take me too much longer, man. Um, yeah, of course, it's going to take longer if you want to let it sit in there, if your hair is really damaged, if you got some issues going on. Um, but for the most part, if your hair is pretty much straight and easy like mine is, it's it's, it's a breeze, dude. It's not hard. Do people ask you, I mean, women come up, hey, what do you do with your hair? Do you do you give, do you, tell me, do you give hair tips? I, I don't. Um, I will. For the most part, I normally just, you know, uh, I'm blessed. Uh, good jeans. You know, that's all I say is good jeans and I'm not talking about Levi's. So, yeah. and then I'll walk away. Uh <laughs> But no, normally, um, if if people do want to ask me personally, um, the traditional native side would tell you yucca roots. So you would find a yucca plant and mm-hmm. find the roots and use that cream and oil and maybe split the yucca in half and get some of that. And that would that would ultimately be the best thing for your hair if you're talking from a traditional aspect. Now, for me, um, the colonized native that I am, I use uh, Moroccan oil. Um, that's Moroccan shampoo and Moroccan conditioner. Um, they're not paying me for it yet, but they should be. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, it's, I love it. It does wonders for my hair. Um, smells good. It's not overpowering. It's not, um, I, I don't know. It's just, I, I, that's my word of advice. If you, uh, have hair troubles and if you happen to, everyone's got different hair. My hair happens to be straight and for the most part, it's easy to maintain. So for me, that works great. It may not work great for you, whoever next, because you know, we have different hair. So it's almost like uh, not everyone's the same. So whatever works to you, 
make it work, you know. But I use Moroccan yeah. oil. Long story short. <laughs> gotcha. That's, and you were talking about the 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 other gentleman you're with. Is it the Lakota? Lakota tribe you were Mo, with the other Mo day? Mo brings plenty. Yeah, Mo brings plenty. Oh, that plenty was Mo. Okay. And you were talking about yeah. the hair length and what it actually, mm-hmm. what it means as far as, mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, will it, will your hair get to a point where it's almost touching the ground if it's healthy enough or will it? It should. Uh, I don't know if it will, um, especially with all the sickness going around. Like, for example, what I mean by that is I got COVID and I lost a lot of hair during that time. Um, so, Yes, it can potentially get there if I continue to maintain it and keep up with it and keep it healthy. Um, if I continue to get sick or if I, you know, God forbid later on something happens and, and I, yeah, it, it's tough. Uh, it's very, very tough, but it is very, very powerful and it's meaningful for us to have this long hair. The more hair you have, the more wisdom, the more um, supposed to be wisdom, I should say, you have, the more experience. It's just, you know, it's just, it's powerful. It's just, that it holds, holds everything of what you've been working for right here. Um, yeah. I, I wish I could exp- explain it more, but I really can't. <laughs> I get it. But now, yeah. now going back to when you were younger, though, as a kid, I mean, in college years, you had no hair, right? Sure. No. And now there, you had no wisdom from uh, how I you didn't. were raised now to maybe, look at it. Maybe that's why I was a knucklehead. Maybe that's why I didn't listen. Maybe that's why I had such a hot temper. Um, I, there's many things that I could attribute it to, but not having hair was also that lack of knowledge that I, that I didn't have. You know, I I, every single year would go see my family. I would go to the Choctaw Labor Day Festival. I would be with my people for I'm 34 now for 34 years. I would go once a year, two times a year and see them. But that still wasn't enough to to grasp and learn all of the knowledge that now I have. And so, again, had I had done these things earlier, I probably would have learned, you know, start growing my hair out, show my power. Uh, But then again, in small schools, they wouldn't let you have hair like this. Now, I don't know if they made if they would have made an exception for me because of my heritage. They may have, but still, we just didn't want to deal with it, so we just cut it off. And and it was always easier to maintain this hair throughout high school with sports and stuff like that. Versus now, it's a it's a little bit of a process if we want to get a game of basketball in. You know what I mean? Or that's what I'm wondering. Gotta, yeah, trying to just yeah. tie it up. Yeah, to, like, I mean, you notice every time I'm running, I'm having it braided up because yeah, if it's just down and out, I'm running. Um, that wind is very damaging to my hair. <laughs> I, f- I, f- I figured as much as far as that's why I said it's just easy and. You know, the mm-hmm. beard thing. I finally grew a beard. I'm like, eh, I'll keep it. I went no shave November and I finally trimmed it up just after football season ended. But I, once it's, I'm, I'm worried about a tan and everything else. Yeah. So, yeah, so man, that, I can't, uh, this is, I get a little bit of goat hair right here, the goat goatee, and then a little can, bit of a, a little mustache. Just pull but. your hair across. You can have it where it's, yeah, <laughs> you get the full on. I get the idea of it for sure. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, so as far, you know, your hair, the heritage and everything else. So what is the one thing that you've learned most about the Choctaw nation that you really hold, hold dear as far a tradition or, or anything that really stands out to you that, that, that maybe you say, oh, man, I missed out on that as a kid. Now I'm, I really want to get into it. Is there anything that really stands out to you? Oh yeah. There's multiple things. The biggest one to me is though, is the traditional dancing. You know, when I was a kid, I'd get out there and dance in a powwow, but I didn't, I wasn't mm, educated enough to know how to build and create my own regalia, um, whether that be head pieces or shoulder pieces, um, including feathers. Like, that's one thing I really wish that I knew and that I grew up in was creating my own regalia sets that would allow me to go out there and participate. And not only that, but just learning the traditional ways of dancing, the different um, steps, the different types of dances. That's something that's very key because I don't know if you've ever been to a powwow, but being there does something to your soul. Hearing that first drum. uh, Yeah, it's very, very, very powerful. Um, Hearing the singing is just, and just seeing all the regalia, all the different colors, all the different feathers, um, all the different ways that we're creative and, and trying to stand out. I think that's just something that I really, really, really wish that I had grown up more in and been involved in more. Um, Because when you go and ask, you know, it's tough to, you can have somebody teach you about it, but if you didn't grow up with your relatives teaching you or them putting in different emphasis on the way a certain feather should hold or bend or not face this way should be, uh, there's just so much that goes into it. And those are things that you learn with experience actually being in it every single day, which I won't ever get. Um, But yeah, I... That's something that I wish I was more involved in. Um, also, I think for me, I'd like to be more involved with 
I think just being, I don't know how, what the word I'd be looking for, but I want to be more, um, I want our elders to have more of a voice. I want our elders to be doing podcasts and teaching us certain things because those are walking encyclopedias for us. And so if there was a way that I could be more involved with our elders to learn from them and to kind of create a platform that allows them to showcase what they've learned throughout this, you know, wild, wild change from even just in the 60s to now. Um, I mean, it's just it's powerful stuff. You know, it's it's stuff that we lose on an everyday basis and we never really think about it because it's out of sight, out of mind. But I, I definitely would like to be involved more with our elders in this and just, you know creating a platform for them to speak. Have you had those conversations with them that just try and, you know, saying, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, someone might like you talk about, might look at you differently because you weren't mm-hmm. born on the reservation, but just saying, mm-hmm. guys, I, how can I help you? I mean, have, mm-hmm. have you had that conversation with them to just, yeah. to be able to, to get it out? Oh yeah. I've, I've had multiple conversations with our chief. We're actually working on some things right now um, with the language department to try to get um, some, we, we got a lot of things working, let's just say that. So I, I'm very blessed in that aspect that my chief listens to me and he points me in the right direction of who I need to speak to in order to get things done. Um, so having that connection is very powerful. And uh, I, I feel as though, like I said, me being a bridge, um, this is just another opportunity for me to connect certain things to make other people be able to communicate better and just have different views and express their opinions and thoughts about ways we're living, the ways we're doing things right, the way we're doing things wrong. So. Yeah, and that again just comes with wisdom and and time and experience from our elders. So yeah, if, if I can be that bridge, let me be that bridge. Yeah. So you you know you do some of the, you know, some of the acting and stuff that you go through, and if if something goes, you know, it's right. We see movies. It's not always one hundred percent accurate from what mm-hmm. real what it is in reality. So if something comes up as far as that might go against the the Choctaw heritage or something, mm-hmm. right? Do you run that by them or is that something where you just say, no, I can't do it? Be, or yeah, how, how do you handle that situation if it's not, it goes against what you're taught, what you're, what the Choctaw nation believes? Uh, it's definitely reaching out to people. You never, you know, hearing no is better than not reaching out and trying to get a question answered at all. And what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes if I'm going into, I did a, an Apache role where I reached out to, real Apaches from where we were filming and I had them educate me on certain verbiage I would use, certain things I wouldn't wear. Um, you know, it, it, there's a, a wide range of things. And in today's world, it's extremely tough because everyone's being held to the truth. They don't want a white guy playing a native anymore. Um, so it's very difficult and scary at the same time because there's always going to be somebody, there's always going to be that one person that may have said, you know, well, they wouldn't have done it this way, or we wouldn't have pronounced that that way. And, and so that stays in the back of my mind constantly. But me doing what I think in, is appropriate and what I feel is right would be reaching out to those communities that I'm representing. For me, if it's Choctaw, I go straight to my tribe. Uh, for a matter, As a matter of fact, I did a movie called Far Haven that'll be coming out this year. Um, and so this movie here, I'm speaking nothing but Choctaw in it. And... Um, there was things that happened throughout that showcased I would be traveling from certain areas of where Choctaws normally wouldn't travel, but we made an exception for this movie and it was cleared through my tribe to be able to say that, okay, yeah, this possibly could have happened and this is how you would have said things and this is how we would have done or how we would have dressed. Always run it by my tribe to make sure. Um, the last thing I want to do is just go against them and, you know, paint a picture of them the wrong way that they may not, that they may not want. So yeah, a lot of a lot of education, a lot of learning, a lot of patience goes into taking and accepting certain roles. Um, I always want to do my due diligence and make sure that I'm doing right by everybody. And so that's that's a big key into the process of prepping for a role or for a movie scene or even just reading a script. I need to understand what the what the idea is and how they're painting us to be because, you know, it's very easy to have history misconstrued and changed. And so we want to make sure we're doing it the right way. And that in, that includes different tribes that I'm representing. Which is which is good. That's that learning JP mm-hmm. twenty years ago probably wouldn't have, but now mm-hmm. it seems that as you go, you're taking it. Even if they they're not, you're still taking Choctaw with you, right? Mm-hmm. It's just a matter mm-hmm. of hey, that's the you're the voice for them, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it's 
and it's you see like you talk about these roles that you're creating of mm -hmm. 20 years ago 30 years ago this wouldn't have been wouldn't have been possible but mm -hmm. so you're you're like you're that beacon of of light for that for the Choctaw Nation but just for Native Americans in general to be able to guys you have an opportunity right to 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 learn from what you know the mistakes or whatever that they, even you talk about your mistakes but making it better, learning, diving into, because I'm sure there's a lot more that weren't born on reservations that are, you know, in the same boat that you were in, but how can I get into that culture? How do I do that? So, I mean, you, the, the doors that you're opening up that you might not even know of right now, but in 15 years, Hey, I remember watching this guy, JP, mm -hmm. when I was a kid and, you know, and here we are today. So, I mean, you, do you think about that? But it, it, like you talk about it though, Whenever somebody mentions anything like that, it's, like I said, you you just light up like a Christmas tree. That just mm -hmm. you, you welcome that. You you know you're just you're like me. You want more and more people around because of the voice that you have, and for those that didn't have a voice to be able to say, "Hey, here we are, right? We're we're no different than anybody else. We're we're just we're here, right? You're yeah. we're I'm a I'm a fun guy, right? You're just yeah. you're just out there, and I mean, and just to see that it, you know, it's, it's, it's just great. And the opportunities that you've created for, you know, for you, I mean, for your daughter, for whoever it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, do you ever even think about, you know, where you've, where you are now to where you've, where you've come from? I think about it all the time, man. I honestly, and it goes, it goes again, me battling myself with my inner demons saying, why do, why, why me? Why do I deserve this? All the, you know, BS I've done in my life, all the wrong that I've done, the way I've treated people. And uh, again, I attribute it to just, ancestors telling me look you know we went through what we went through for you and so yeah it's now it's time for you to receive the i guess the i don't know the repercussions whatever you want to call it the i don't know the reparations whatever you want to call it um honestly it's very tough um and if i ever cross a line or do something that i feel as though natives from my tribe wouldn't do or anything like that i feel free to have them always reach out to me i always tell people look educate me if I'm doing something wrong, tell me. I can fix it. But I don't know what I don't know. And if you're not telling me, um, then how can I grow and get better? And I'm be the first to admit that if I make mistakes, I would wrong, I, I will correct the wrong, I should say. So I, I don't ever want somebody to feel like they don't have an open doorway to me to come to me and tell me, hey, look, this doesn't seem right or I don't think we would do it this way. Please, I, I'm open ears. I accept all of that because, again, that is growth. If I'm not growing, then I'm being stagnant. I don't want to be stagnant. I want to continue to excel and succeed. So help me, help me help you, whether it's um, opening a door for you to speak or maybe taking over my live, whatever I can do to help other tribes or help acknowledge and, and just pretty much showcase that we're still here. Like you said, I mean, I'm all about it and I'm not going to stray away from anything that I do that's wrong. I'll own it and I will take full responsibility and I'll correct it and do everything I can in my power to, to be better next time. Do you have other, uh, other Native American tribe nations reach out to you wanting you to come talk to them as far yeah. as just about you do about what it means you know just what you've gone through and how you can right because that's more more doors you're opening up you've you have been uh, approached about doing those things oh yeah up in utah i've uh, been able to visit some reservations and just kind of show them a lot of them didn't understand the Choctaws and didn't know um certain parts of our history so that for me was cool to be able to go out there and just say hey look you know we're still here southeastern part of Oklahoma, a big representation out in Mississippi as well. Um, that, like you said, it's cool because to see their reaction, um, it's funny because I'm a jokester, man. There's not a place I don't go where I bust jokes on somebody and it might even offend some people, but they're all in good love and good intentions, right? So I'm busting jokes to some people. And I remember one of the natives from North Dakota was like, I called somebody stupid. Like, man, you're stupid. You know, and like, and I walked away joking. And he was like, you know, you guys down there are different. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. He's like, you call me stupid. Them there are fighting words. And I'm like, nah, nah, we were joking. He's like, no, I get it. He goes, I don't know how to describe you. I'm just going to say, that's JP. So it's cool because they see a different side of natives that they didn't really know exist. Um, for example, like our Southern draw, you know, I have a very strong Southern draw. Um, I, I can turn it off and turn it on. And thanks to acting. But for the most part, I let, you know, when I'm natural and I'm happy and having a blast, my Texas accent comes out. And uh, it's cool because for the natives specifically that I'm talking about when I was talking to them, they didn't, they didn't know, you know, like we were just different to them, uh, just a different breed, the way that I talked, the way that I joked. Uh, it was cool because our features, you know, they noticed certain things about me being light skinned. Most Choctaws are really, really dark. 
Um, so I, I have a little bit of Irish in me as well from my grandmother's side. So I think that's uh, it's pretty cool um, to be able to show them like, you know, we are all different walks of life, but we all have the same goal of just trying to be acknowledged and, you know, just being cautious of that. We're all still here and letting everyone know that, hey, yeah, yeah, we do exist and we all come in different shapes, sizes, forms, colors, all that. So uh, I think it's very, very cool to be able to go to these different reservations and talk to these different tribes because like I said it helps me grow it shows them a side of a different tribe they didn't know so I, I, I'm very grateful for that and I'll continue to do it as much as I'm invited and yeah if it continues to be little kids I'm speaking to elders whatever I'm gonna do it with love because that's all I got now <laughs> yep it's not like I said it's of you know you think about where you started where you are now JP the reach mm -hmm. that you have of of just being out and just like you said being you but yeah, I was a knucklehead as here, but I'm I'm still that that guy. But I'm yeah. almost like the, the maturity level has gone from where you you know from zero to a hundred of where you are. But it mm -hmm. just goes back to you of how fast you can run, of, of how fast you can change mm -hmm. things. But seeing how far your reach is, it's a, it's amazing though. And like I said, you you you're taking it in stride, and you're you're just kind of it's like it's, it's, your arms are open. Everybody that comes in, it just runs into into JP and what you're about and, and how you can help, whether it's, you mean, I'll have to be even native American, right? It yeah. just be any kind of minority of just saying, yeah. guys, here it is. Here's the opportunities that I've been blessed with. Yeah. I was a, I was an idiot. I did a lot of dumb stuff. We mm -hmm. all did, but you know, I, I realized that that was done for a reason. I might have not liked it, but it, it's put me in the position that I am now mm -hmm. to make you what you are now you're you are the voice for you know for 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 that choctaw nation to be able and who's to say other voices right it's to say i'm just a kid from palmer texas yep. right who am i but you know here i am but and it's and that's the beauty of it like you said you treat the janitor like you treat the ceo they're all the same and that's just mm -hmm. how we were you that's how i was brought up that's how you were raised but it's mm -hmm. but it's fun though right because you get a chance yeah. to to hear different stories i'm sure you've heard some great stories of of uh of, of different, just different people, what they've learned, you know, that's, that's probably the biggest thing is just what you hear. Yeah. I think the knowledge that comes from hearing other people's trials and trials and tribulations, um, and seeing them overcome them. Um, that's a, that's a big key factor for me because I, I, I always say this, like, I don't want to go to a church and listen to a pastor who's, and no offense to them, but I don't want to go to a church and listen to a pastor whose dad was a pastor and his grandfather was a pastor and he just followed the lines. Not saying he hasn't been anything, but I want to go to the guy who's tatted up. He's been to prison. He's been down there in the slumps and now he's found his way back and he's expressing that and showing that and sharing that with everybody. That's the kind of leaders that I look for and I look to. So again, it attributes me to going down into the slumps and finding these people and just spending time with them and learning them. And that's attributed to my success, uh, a big part of my success here now today. Uh, another thing that I attribute to the change from then till now and the growth would be I learned to not find things offensive. And what I mean by that is that most of us have this chip on our shoulder. Um, you know, oh, they did this to me or this person did that to me. And when in reality, it's all about you. Well, do you find offense to it? Because if you find offense to it, then your life must be pretty miserable. And that's one thing I want to stress to people is don't go looking for things to be offensive because more than likely they're going to find them offensive. And that's got to be a terrible way to live your life. Um, if you don't allow anything to offend you, trust me, your life will be so much better. Now, of course, that comes with stipulations. Not Don't just let someone walk all over you and disrespect you, but also don't let something that somebody unintentionally did with lack of knowledge offend you because they didn't know. So that's my advice to every single person listening or watching, you know, just go out there with this intent of, spreading love being positive and not looking for the negative yeah that's that's the beauty of it like you said it's just mm -hmm. right we we're all the same yeah. we're, we're no different so it's you know you get a chance like i said i always see what you're doing on on uh on social media and everything else mm -hmm. i saw your dad the other day he was you always talk about your dad how much yeah, a man. great cook your dad is mm -hmm. right he was he took a picture of uh, what do you call them? these texas there's i forget what they are there was some sort and he goes these are phenomenal so we got to figure out how, how can we get your dad to start making us some food because it's making me hungry when i when i sit there and watch all that stuff first off let me tell you the texas yeah. twinkies are That's giant it. bell they're giant bell pepper stuff with cream cheese and his brisket wrapped in bacon and they're smoked um <laughs> they are absolutely incredible he can post a post on facebook and have them all like 250 of them sold 
in a matter of 20 minutes, 10 minutes, if that. Um, they go off, they go pretty crazy. Um, his ribs, his brisket, I mean, they're they're top tier. You know, I've taken them to many um, food critics who have been traveled all over the world, four or five star restaurants, and they say, I've never had ribs as good as your dad's. And, you know, he's his hardest critic, man. He, you know, every time I did something a little different this time, I don't know if they taste as good, but every single time, uh, I guess you can use the generational word right now, they slap, which means they are good. That's what my nieces say. Oh, it slaps. She takes a bite. She says, oh, this slaps. Um, so it's 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 pretty cool to see his growth in that department. Um, Kevin, my dad is a hustler, man. I've never had a day off with this guy around. You know, there'd be days where I'd had a full week of baseball tournaments left and right, and on Saturday I didn't have anything to do. It was clear we didn't have any work. He'd wake me up at seven in the morning, and be like, "Hey, we gotta fix this fence out here." There was always <laughs> something to do, and I I'm very grateful that he instilled that in me, man. And I see him. Now with his multiple businesses, he's got a bounce house business, a train business. Uh, he's got uh, the food catering business. I mean, this guy is motivation Just had a birthday too, me. right? Just had his birthday, the 14th. Happy birthday, dad. Um, yeah. So, he, you know, I got a young dad, man, and I'm very grateful um, to have my parents. You know, they were really young when they had me, you know, 19 and 20. And uh, it wasn't easy. You know, they were still kids. I, you know, I guess you can say a lot of my bad attitude come from what I saw with them. And what I saw from family members, um, so it, it you know it always trickles down. But I always say I have the ability to learn from that and not continue those same mistakes. So I'm grateful for everything that we have, and I'm grateful for my dad cooking this food, man. I got to get you some food quick. Absolutely, um, I need just, to come down. I'm gonna have to come down yeah. there. I'm telling come you, man. And, uh, people lose their minds, dude. Yeah, he was telling me about. It. He said these things are phenomenal. I said, yeah. yeah. Every time I see him on there, and he's making me hungry. So you yeah. get a chance to anybody listening. To, you, it's, well, it's just it's just your dad's Red name, Cooler right? Just James. You what can it? go to Instagram, look up Red Cooler Barbecue. Okay. Um, and that's something. Yeah, it's uh, he's got his own Instagram page. He doesn't post too much on there. Oh, but that's yeah. separate than from his own his own personal. Yeah, one yeah. That's got, right. Because your too. dad's always commenting on my stuff on there and stuff yeah. all the time. So okay. Gosh, yeah. good old James. Yeah, man, he's a he's a he's a sweet guy and one of the most loving people. You know, real quick, there's stories that he does, like things that he does, and you know, most people want to get accolades and record me doing this nice thing for this person, right? Well, I don't do those things, and I can't tell you how many times I've done something nice for somebody because I think what would my dad do? And so, quick story, real quick, my dad would always gather these cans everywhere he would go. He'd pick up cans and put them in a trash bag. He'd set them outside of the house, a bunch of trash cans, or uh, Coke cans, Dr Pepper cans, whatever. And so I said, Dad, why are you doing that? And he said, there's this Jamaican guy, an older Jamaican guy that he does it for that comes down here and just picks him up. So my dad literally finds things, washers, dryers. He knows this guy going to the scrapyard. So he's always constantly going and getting this guy stuff. And that's just one of the little things that he does. He doesn't get asked to do these things. The guy, you know, barely knows my dad for barely, barely really knows my dad at all. But he's so grateful every time he comes over, he just, he can rely on my dad to do something so small like that, man. And that just goes so far. So that's also instilled in me. And I attribute that to how I am now, man. I just, you know, I want to do those little things without all the accolades. I just want to do it because it's the right thing to be do, done. You talk about what Jesus talks about, right? Don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, and that's, that's, that's good. To, like, you know, of how you what you've taken as a kid and, and, and instilled in what you're doing today. And then you can pass it along to your daughter. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's amazing though, just to see that and, you know, to see where this ends up taking you, JP, how far this is, this is going to go. You know, this is, I think you're just scratching the surface, right? I, I, I feel as though, um, you know, I have some, I have some rituals that I do some ceremonial rituals and I can tell you that I've had conversations with my ancestors. There's three in particular um, that tell me that so much more is coming and that I don't know the definition of it or the reasoning behind it, but they keep telling me to look out for the tree of life. Something something to do with me being on top of the tree of life, meaning that I have, um, for better terms, or for better or lack of terms, I should say, I have completed something that allows me to sit on top of this tree. And I, I know this may sound crazy and it may not make any sense to you because it still doesn't make any sense to me. But basically my concept of what they're telling me is that I have mastered the ability to communicate life and just accept and enjoy life. And that symbolization is me sitting on top of the tree of life. So I still am learning on that and I still have more conversations to have with them. But there's three ancestors in particular that are really looking out for me and guiding me. 
And I, it's overwhelming at times, man. I don't know why it's happening, like I said, but I'm very grateful for it. And I don't take it for granted, not one bit. I'm glad you know, I can see that. Like I said, in the smile and when you talk about it, you know, the, yeah. your enthusiasm and what it means to you being, mm-hmm. you know, nat- you're a native Texan, but you're mm-hmm. also native, you're Choctaw native. So, I mean, it's, you've got that, that combination, you know, there's probably mm-hmm. aren't a lot of you. I mean, especially mm-hmm. in the position that you're in to be able mm-hmm. to, 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 in, into the acting side, the modeling side, to be able to, to represent both sides of it. And it's amazing. So, so people can keep up with you through what, through social media accounts, what you're at what are all your social media accounts you had a couple different ones so i have um my own personal page which is choctaw native jp that's on instagram i don't really do the facebook so much i keep facebook more or less for family and friends um it, i do have a native page um that you can follow on facebook it's native jeremy g um so you can search me and find me there again most of my content is on uh, instagram um i seem to have better response and just the algorithms work better for me for some reason um but yeah, you can check out my website, jeremygaona.com. Again, that's jeremygaona.com. There's ways that you can look at everything I got going on there, some of the pictures I've done. Or you can also just IMDB Google me and they'll show you what I've, projects I've worked on, what I've got coming up. Um, yeah, a lot of cool things. Um, I'm with the Dragonfly Agency out of Dallas. That's my modeling agency. And we got some things working up there as well. Uh, shout out to Cowboys and Indians Magazine. I absolutely love everybody there. Shout out to everybody at Teton Ridge as well. Um, These are all partners and people that I um, become really close with and built relationships with. And I'm very grateful for everything that Cowboys and Indians does for me, Um, Teton Ridge as well. So, yeah, it's there's I could list a name, a wide name. It'll take forever for us to go through it. The people that have opened (laughs) doors for me, man. And and a lot of the things that I have gotten have been word of mouth. Um, You know, hey, I know this native named Jeremy or hey, I know this native guy, Jeremy. And. I am very grateful. And again, I attribute that to how I treat people. Um, yeah. And like I said, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier is you never know what that person is going through. So um, you treat that person with love and respect. They can never come back and say, well, you know what? He was in butthole to me or he was rude to me. You know, they never have that on me because no matter how much of a B word you were to me, I was still cool and kept it calm and just gave you love. So that's that's what I'm trying to go for. And that's all I want to be remembered for. That's it, man. Like you said, it's <laughs> yeah. But and I and I love the fact, like you said, you can't know where you're going until you know where you've been, and that's the biggest thing. Where you're you're trying to learn that and and, and that, and just being able to uh, to speak because the Choctaw Nation's growing for sure. I mean, oh, it's yeah. there's stuff all over Texas now that's starting to do that. And like I said, you're like I said, you're just scratching the surface of uh, of what you're of the reach you have. So, mm-hmm. but man, JP, I appreciate you jumping on and and. Uh, and just being able to sit here and tell your story. You know, some people mm-hmm. don't get a chance to, they can't read about all this stuff sometimes. And just, you know, like I said, hearing, hearing your personality and, and what it's like, just, just dealing with you. I mean, people can see you on social media, but until they actually mm-hmm. have this conversation, they really don't know what it's like to, to, to be in your shoes other than, Oh, I've seen him on TV. No, JP's a good guy. You know, he's no different than you Thanks. and I, right. We just mm-hmm. have fun with it. And they said, I'm looking forward to the, to the softball game. And, uh, in November, but before that, I'll definitely tell your dad. I'm gonna come down there and tell him I'll be ready to eat because I have a weight problem. I cannot wait to eat. Okay, I, uh, <laughs> we'll do that. We'll figure out. We'll get a hat or something. We tell you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm. I'm very grateful for this, Kevin. I appreciate you bringing me on, man. I, uh, yeah, I look forward to doing it again eventually. I'm sure it'll happen oh. again. We'll be on. Uh, but next Absolutely. time we do this, the only way I will do it, the only stipulation I have is if you wear a shirt and open it like that guy on your shirt. Okay. Okay. This is, hey, it's my only St. Patty's day shirt. I, my kids love wrestling. So the 24 seven champ, I did not know that they got yeah. rid of it in November. Once Vince McMahon went away. So okay. I told my daughter, this shirt's expensive now. So I'm going to have to, I probably can't wear it again, but this is what it is. I, my kids love wrestling. That's all it's about. So I That's mean, beautiful, man. Yeah. I grew yeah. up with, I grew up watching wrestling as well. And it yeah. was, uh, yeah. See, I, I didn't. And then they saw it one day okay. on TV and go, Yep, we're gonna start watching that. And then it got tough during COVID, but and now they love it. So yeah. That's awesome. But yeah. Yeah. So yeah. But well, man, I, I appreciate I, you grateful. jumping on, dude. Yes, absolutely, man. I know you'll be traveling a lot with with what you're doing. And like I said, we'll keep in touch and uh I said we'll follow you on, on social media. But tell your dad, I'm gonna tell him to say, Look, I'm hungry. I want some of these to to go. I'll buy a vat of them, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. Okay. We'll come down there when you're back and figure it out. So we'll just we'll plan ahead for all of it. So okay. sounds good, brother. All man. right, yeah. 
anything you need from me, you holler at me. You know my number. You know how to get in touch with me. So yes, sir, man. Give me a call. I, I appreciate, it, man. Hey, keep keep fighting a good fight, brother. Like I said, I will, it's man. it's fun watching everything. So I appreciate it. And Kevin, in case I don't get to tell you tomorrow, man, I love you and I'm grateful for you. Thank you for having me on, brother, man, and uh, all the love to you and your family, dude. Love you, brother. We'll be in, we'll be in touch, man. Like I said, like I said, I'm looking forward to it. Cool. So, yes, sir, man. I appreciate it. Yes, sir.